blue sheet of paper that everybody looks at and goes, that's my soil test results, and give it to the fertiliser advisors to give them a recommendation. Our big point of difference is we've actually designed you a fertiliser program based on all the soil essential mineral elements. So, we've got a clicker here. Yep, the right hand button, that's worn away a bit, yeah. Right hand is forward, right hand down. So, So one of the things we do is we simplify soil testing so that everybody can understand it. I've actually gone to a group of fifth formers and sat down and showed them what we do and why we do it and they go, oh, that's easy. But you give it to a professional in the industry and they go, I don't understand that. And go, what do you mean? Fifth formers can understand this. So the main thing is never to be scared of the soil and learn to love it. The first hurdle we have to get over is take ownership of it both chemically, physically, and environmentally. Now, as you drive around the farm, I'm just going to run you through how good you guys are at understanding soil science. When you're driving around the farm, this is what's going through your head, isn't it? It's a complex set, set of three-dimensional calculations that you're doing all the time. You're processing the weather conditions, you're processing your lambing dates, you're processing whether you should be bringing hoggett mating in and what I might have to do, i.e. do I change my carbon date or do I have to get rid of my five-year-old so I can squeeze hoggets in. I don't know why you didn't do that, but... So, all these things are just going through your head constantly, aren't they? Just ticking away in the background, that's how you're processing information as a farmer to make your day-to-day -day decision, decisions. And then you get inside at night thinking you've made all your decisions for the day and you look at the weather forecast and go, bugger it. I'm going to have to change all that again. So you immediately start thought processing again. Now, the main thing about farming is it all begins in the soil. All life begins in the soil. Oh, you've got hydroponics, sorry. Yeah. So um, as farmers in New Zealand, we rely on the soil and we rely on two free cycles. Those are the two free cycles that we can tap into. The nitrogen cycle, the only way that nitrogen can be made available for plants to begin the whole food chain is it has to be provided by the soil. Not even legumes can fix their own nitrogen. They're called nitrogen fixing plants, but in actual fact, They've got little bugs in their root nodules and they rely on the bacteria to fix nitrogen. Didn't exist before 1965 in New Zealand, but we won't go into that, it's a long story. So we know that it's a biological function of nitrogen fixation. And often we look at a nitrogen deficiency and we go, oh, it's a nitrogen deficiency. Now that's an easy out. Could have been potassium, could have been manganese, could have been iron. You don't know unless you look a little bit deeper just to call it a nitrogen deficiency and go and put nitrogen as a cheap out. You need more information than that to see why you can't tap into this natural cycle that's actually been going for a million years. Likewise, the carbon cycle. The only plant, or the only um, beast in the food chain that can actually tap into carbon is a plant. Animals can't produce nitrogen and they can't produce carbon. The plant's the only one that can take carbon from the atmosphere and add it into the food chain. The soil is the only one that can produce the nitrogen. Now if you want to um, go to a real good marriage counsellor, study the interreaction between the carbon and nitrogen and plant and soil cycles. They can't live without each other and they have to be in balance, otherwise stuff goes bad. So they're really good marriage guidance councils. So to move on to see how easy it is for farmers to understand all the intricacies of what's going on in the soil, I'll just go back for a minute. I actually um my old university lecturer asked me to put this together to explain soil science. If 
for him. No big deal, is it? You can't change one without affecting the other. It's all about balance. And it's all about balance through the food chain. And that begins in the soil. So we don't look at all those elements because they don't all have known quantities and you can't measure them in the soil. Like, for instance, you can't actually measure selenium in the soil. There's plant available, you can only measure it as a total pool. So we can't give you any advice on, on what's unknown. We only work with the known numbers. So from, does anybody not understand that? So now you all understand, don't you? <laughs> Not one hand went up. It's easy, isn't it? We're going to do some stuff on the board soon. We're going to look at how the soil drives production economics. And if you get it wrong, I'll fail. But I'm sure you'll get it right. So what we do in the laboratory is we look at all the soil essential elements because they've got a role to play, and we measure them. This is the standard model up here, NPKS. That's, there's 16 soil essential elements. There's four up there. Um, who on earth would ever think of such a simplistic idea that think life could exist on four elements? I don't know. The thing is, if you put those four elements on, and you've got plenty of them, you will grow lots of grass. How many of you are in the business of selling grass? You sell grass? To my animals. <laughs> <laughs> you trade. You trade grass for the animal for the animals. So nobody actually sells grass, do they? So is the point of growing grass about growing volume, or is it about the economics of growing grass and converting it to something that you can sell? The economics of the food chain until it leaves your farm. So the economics is an animal performance, really, isn't it? Just to say you've grown a huge volume of grass just gives, gives you a feel-good buzz. Because you're not selling the grass, and you're not selling the soil. It's part of your food chain. And don't forget, humans are at the end of it, and they'll have some say in the future on how they want to eat. So from that, we then start to put all the numbers in, so there's a heap of numbers on here, but what's really interesting is looking at the this set down here. It's all in kilograms per hectare. Anybody not know what a kilogram is? Well, anybody not know what a hectare is? Right, we can move on. Anybody know what a milligram per kilogram is? It's concentration. No. Concentration. Yeah, who cares? <laughs> so that's not the language that we farm in, is it? We don't farm in milligrams per kilogram, or per litre, or whatever. We farm in kilograms in hectares. So what we do is we do the PPMs, or milligrams per kilogram, and then we transfer it through into <coughs> kilograms per hectare. This is why fifth form is... What year is fifth form? Eleven. Eleven. Year 11s can get this because it's in a language that they can understand. So why make it a mystery? Why make soil science a mystery? We dem demystify it so that you can watch things change on your farm over the years. You can actually measure the progress in each element and each kilogram. So there's your desired levels. That's what we found. Simple maths. Can't go wrong. We're actually following one of our clients through now. So this is the easy bit. Everybody likes the pictures. So that's the desired level, regardless. Cobalt might be 3 kgs to the hectare. That's the percentage of 3 kgs. Calcium might be 4 tonnes to the hectare, but that's its percentage of its desired level. So the whole model that we work on is based on the ratio theory, but it's a slight hybrid because the ratio theory was never completed. 
So what we did was completed the ratios from here down. The ratio theory, or Albrecht's ratios, which is more than Albrecht, there's a whole team of them put it together. That dealt with calcium, magnesium, potassium and sodium. But we've extended it now to include all the rest of the essential mineral elements that we can measure and give you a recommendation on because they've got no one left in the soil. And it's all about the balance. So the model now, we enter all this information into our fancy computer program and the model's going to get the best performance we want everything as even as possible because that's where your animal performance comes in. If you get that even, they're absolutely smoking along. Low death rates, they just they just behave like animals. They live to reproduce and produce. So, so you're saying they're in balance. If they're even, they're in balance. Yeah. Yep. But we don't stop there because the optimum's here. But the computer says we need things in balance so that you get optimum performance and then start moving through to the to the cream of the cream which is right up here and that's the best you can be. Now from all that information we can then just put together your fertiliser program and that fertiliser program is based on the minerals in each one of those products for that company. We work with quite a few different companies throughout New Zealand so we have to know if that's 10% cobalt or 20% cobalt. Because if you take that list to another company, you'll get a different prescription because they've got different mineral concentrations in their products. So we'll um, go through and we're up to 2016 now. So we've got some kilogram changes there. So what was that first year? 2011. And things are starting to come up and start to line up a bit. So that once again, we readjust, we reassess and build a different fertiliser program now because things have changed. So you might all be thinking, so what's in it for me? Well, once you start putting all these elements into your fertiliser program, it comes down to production economics. So what we're trying to do is create a win, win, win situation. If we start at the soil and look at deficiencies and then build it all into there, then the animals are going to perform better. And, and this, this is actually based on standard modelling. Say you've got a fertiliser spend of 50,000 and this one's got a fertiliser spend of 50,000. So they're both spending the same amount, but then we start to look at what's happening in the production system as the soil starts to build and it's a food chain, so the minerals do not stay in the soil, they enter the food chain. They end up in the plants, they end up in the animals, and you start to get progressive results throughout. So we've got farmer B, he farms in the small square, we'll just put a small square, he's an MPK farmer. And we've got our farmer who's farming in a big square. So he's looking at a bigger, the bigger picture of soil fertility. And he's looking at it long term because he wants it to be there, you know, intergenerational for future farmers. So what actually happens on farms is pretty simple economics. For every, if we use a thousand ewes as an example, how much does it copper capsule, cost to copper capsule a thousand ewes? Maybe a thousand bucks a dollar each, are they? I don't know. Dollar each? <laughs> so you can have an animal health if you're putting in copper, a lot of people are putting in cobalt, etc. And that's all coming into your animal health, and you've got deaths. You know, it's, I was on a farm the other day, it has over 10% deaths in the ewes. So, 10% death rate in use, what's that value? 20 grand. 
Jeez, yeah. Probably more like 35, but we'll call it 20. By the time you you can't sell a hobbit because you've got to replace the U, the yeah, Citra, etc., etc. Yeah. Et yeah. So I work on $350 a U, 20 U that <coughs> doesn't come through and produce you anything. You've had to feed it. That's opportunity lost. Something else could have eaten that grass and turned it into money. So if you work on, are you happy with 35 grand? Yeah, because it actually gets up there pretty quick once you start looking at it into, into depth. Yeah, we've got this farmer over here, he's using the big square and he's only losing 2% use. So that's 10%, what's 2%? Three, three 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 and Sorry? <coughs> Straight away, you can start to see production economics kicking in. Your lowest guy is on. What are you on, Bruce? Two percent. Yeah, two. Two. I think William got down to. Lowest is on one point two or something. Yeah. Yeah. You couldn't find a trail when he had a dead year. This was a feature. Oh well. So. Yes, of course. These, and once you start getting all that soil working for you and these minerals coming through, you can start to eliminate these costs. So animal health issues in here with all your minerals and your zincs and you wouldn't believe how much used rattle on some farms, the amount of stuff that goes down your throat. You know, there's an easy four or five grand. Cost. That's a loss. So straight away, you can you can see how much you can improve the actual financial welfare of your farm, your financial health of your farm, by looking after the health of the soil. Um, dairy farming is no different to sheep and beef farming. You're just converting grass into milk instead of grass into meat. Dairy farming is actually a lot easier than sheep and beef farming because you usually only got one class of animal and hey, you can find a paddock of grass for one class of animal, can't you? You know, so what happens in the dairy industry is reflective of what can happen in the sheep and beef industry. And to be quite honest, we've taken animal health out of the picture and we've saved 30, 40,000 on some farms. So, Getting back to this farm here, what's been going on on this farm here? So if we summarise, oh, go back, sorry. He went and whacked a whole lot of lime on. It wasn't a good idea and he regretted it afterwards because he overdid it and ended up with animal health issues just for a year, well, one spring until it settled down again. So he got his calcium up to where it should be so now he doesn't need any lime in there, so we'll readjust it again. Trouble is, because there's no lime going in there, that costs $600 a tonne, I think it was. So we'll go back over here to our, this is our first spin. So we've got a budget of $50,000, and how many times do you hear people come up the driveway and our, our clients get it all the time? Because they once you start getting up, getting your magnesiums, they're cheap, your calciums are cheap. Once you get those up there, it starts to get dearer per tonne because we've got more trace elements going. And so, you know, that at $600 a tonne. And everybody goes, oh, you'll go broke if, you, if your fertiliser costs you $600 a tonne, won't you? Because you can buy superphosphate. How much is superphosphate? $320. What's the big deal about that? That's no dearer than that, is it? Same price. Production economics state that if you spend 50 grand, you've spent 50 grand. Mm. It costs no more to get it right than it does to get it wrong. It's your farm, you drive that dollar value. I had a guy from Taranaki ring up and said, can you come and see me, Ray? And I said, oh, yeah, why? He said, oh, the fertiliser rep turned up and said, my fertiliser bill was going to be 70000 this year. I go, it's your money. 
He goes, exactly, come over and see me. He was over it. So you drive that figure, you do your budgets, you work out what you can put back into the soil to grow your soil, and you go and buy the right stuff. That does not drive your fertiliser budget. You do. That is no cheaper than that. Because you had a budget of 50000 Right? Anybody not get that? It's just your rate change, no? Yeah, your rate changes, of course. You can roughly put on half the amount of that and twice the amount of that for 50 grand. Don't you? But if you're not getting any result in your production system, what was the point of spending the 50 grand on a cheap $320 product? Production economics don't work like that. So, we'll get back to Graham's farm here. And here we've, we've actually seen, so this is the three years lined up on a row, just in kilograms per year, here, so that you can get a bit of an appreciation of, of what's been going on in the farm. So we can see by this, he's had some little dip here in pH, and then he's whacked his lime when he got it up to 6.3. Notwithstanding the fact that he caused some pretty major issues on his farm for that spring. So, yeah, he hung his head and said that was a bad idea, wasn't it, Ray? And I said, I hate to say so, mate, but I did tell you. <laughs> so, with loss on ignition, so this is your carbon store in the soil. This is a total amount of carbon in the soil. It's not the bioavailable carbon. We stick with the loss of ignition because it's just the bulk carbon store in the soil. Your bioavailable carbon will go up and down with the biological function. Spring it will reach your peak and then it will tail a bit in summer and peak up again. <coughs> so as we go down through all these we can just see changes in kilograms per hectare across these elements. Some have dropped. Uh, we see as phosphate, the brake 2 is the secondary available phosphate in the soil, so it's like your backup phosphate. It's the reserves on the bench ready to come on the field. So we're happy with those. They're staying about the same. But the playing team, the team that's out there doing the, doing the hard work, has dropped a little bit. So we've propped that up this year. There's 300 kgs of RPO going into his mix. And the sulfates, they've been pretty consistently high all the way through. It's a volcanic soil. Boron's about the only one that's dropped, and that's really interesting because often it should be going the other way, but the computer picks it up and just puts more in because it's trying to drive it up to the optimum. Iron, it's in a little egg wall, and it's back, that's still in surplus, so we're happy with that. Manganese is coming up all the way through, copper, zinc, cobalt's coming up all the way through. So is that farm going ahead or going backwards? The numbers are right, eh? Yeah, it is, isn't it? Pretty much. So, so the graphs of the blue columns before have all they've all moved up towards that yeah. optimum now. Yeah. yeah, we've had a couple go down. The phosphates dropped. Yeah. Uh, Bull ones dropped a little bit. So now we've reweighted those at a heavier rate going on. So, but what what's interesting on the farm and what all our clients get is the fact that this animal health thing and production. So I'm going to do another little interesting exercise on averaging. I just thought of this the other day, so if you reckon it's a lot of crap, just tell me. So we've got 1 to 10 up here, 1, one 2, So a lot of farms in New Zealand, they pre they're like, you know, your steep hill country farm, stocking rate, what, six, seven units per hectare, or stock units per hectare, they might be producing down here. So we'll call that product, flax production. Use 
green, green cost of production. This is where you make money out of farming. Right, so you'd, you'd assume, wouldn't you, that the average farm would be sort of sitting in the middle here with the production level about there, and once again, the cost, cost of production about there. And you've got a good class of land where guys can stop really highly. Now, right up here, production at that level, and then you look at the costs, because they're cropping, putting them all these crops, they're spending money as fast as they're making it, their costs are there. Which farm's above average, which farm's average, and which farm's below average? They're all the same. They're all average. This is the New Zealand great averaging model at work. The more you produce, the more you spend. The more it costs you, unless you get it right. <laughs> so the real skill in agriculture and using the soil and that whole interrelationship between the soil, the plant and the animal is achieving the ultimate. So it doesn't matter whether you're a low producer, a medium producer or a high producer, the ultimate is driving production to there and costs to there. A little change, that's what I did on my farm, make a huge amount of money. A little change here and a little change there, what does that mean mathematically? The countage. By return. Oh, by how much? Oh, three times that. 50%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Three times that. Yeah. yeah, so you can't claim that bit because everybody's doing that bit. But you can claim that bit and that bit. Yeah. So you got one there and two there. One divided by two times a hundred equals fifty percent. So this guy here is now fifty percent better off than that guy there. He can do it up here. We can do it down there because that's often controlled by stock. Uh, sorry, soil type, topography, and all the rest of that jam that comes into what is a farm. But it doesn't matter where you are. If you make a conscious decision to go. I can sneak a little bit this way and sneak a little bit that way, all of a sudden, the accountant, my accountant, summons me. He goes, what are you doing? I said, well, I hope it's working. You're going to tell me. And he goes, yeah, it's working all right. We didn't chase any one single thing. That's why we designed those fertilizer programs the way we do. You don't chase the God of agriculture, phosphate, you've got to look at how they all interact so you can make subtle changes. It's the same principle in the soil that it is in production economics. You see, anybody can grow a heap of crops and then just pile on more lambs, but they just spent more money and made more food. So they're heroes because they're going to feed an ever-increasing world population but they haven't achieved anything personally. They've worked harder, but they haven't got a head. They're still average. Production Economics 101. <coughs> so, we all know this guy's going ahead pretty easy. You can see, you can look at it. There, he's going ahead. Cool. So we're trying to set ourselves on the world stage and we're trying to wait, look at new ways to market meat and, and find a niche in the world that we can really sell ourselves forward, aren't we? I mean, that's what we've been talking about. So how do you get true value? What does it mean for true value looking after your soil properly? Tender a stake in New Zealand. That's the gold medal. And his heifer, two heifers, he's a stud breeder. He sent his two cull heifers off to the stake of origin competition. So he got a gold and a bronze. And everybody goes, what's everybody thinking? 
oh, anybody can set up to win that competition, eh? <laughs> you know? Yeah, feeding them carrots. And... Yeah, yeah, feed them up, feed them carrots. Well, I'll tell you what, he feeds grass and hay. Hay over winter and grass for the rest of the year. And the back of the farm's at 2,000 feet. I should have said that in metres, shouldn't I? So, you know, the sceptical say, oh, yeah, it's a one-off. Cool. You know, he's the hero, he did it once. What did he win the next year? He put his two heifers on the truck and there was a steer, and the steer started bellowing. Oh, bugger it, I'll chuck that on too, because he didn't want one steer in the paddock by itself. Chuck it on. There's actually three medals around that guy's neck this, neck this year. A gold, a silver, and a bronze. And he feeds them grass and hay. So, people often have the ex they have an excuse, oh, my stock aren't performing and they just can't get you. You can't find out why. You've got to dig deeper back into your production system. Don't go forward, don't go running down to the vet and go, should I need something? Because my stock aren't performing. You go backwards and you find out why. You either go back to the soil or you go back to the herbage. Like I was saying before, we do herbage analysis because the climate will affect how much protein, carbohydrates in your pasture. And sometimes you just want to know the answers. Well, we can give it to you. We had a case of lambs putting on no weight on lucerne. So up from the South Island comes a bag of lucerne, 37.6% protein. It's a wonder they were still alive. But it was a paddock full of kilograms of dry matter, so you, because you've got kilograms of dry matter, you put some animals in there. There's some kilograms of dry matter, eat, behave, grow fast. Bollocks. It's not that simple. So if you want to arm yourself with more information about animal performance, about your soil performance, you can't just guess it. I a, got involved with a mob of steers, beautiful big bullocks doing 200 grams a day. The guy got them in to weigh them. Should have been up to wait till go off to the sale. 60 days I'd put on a couple hundred grams a day. No energy in the grass. You need energy for growth. So if you want to know grass, you have to learn grass. And just by looking over the fence, and going, there's that many kilograms of dry matter in that paddock, I'll put X amount of sheep in there and I'll do 1.2, you know, a day, or sorry, cattle. And then you pull them out and re-weigh them and go, ooh, it's because you haven't learned grass. It's the same thing with crops. Guys will put crop, lambs in crops and they just sit and sit and sit because they don't understand animal nutrition. Then eventually they start going. Well, the gut takes, the rumen takes three weeks to make that transition. So a lot of people have, um, get a little bit disappointed about crop performance. Well, it's not the crop, they just haven't understood that the animal can't handle the crop and haven't measured what's in it. So New Zealand agriculture is split into two groups and it's got a crossover in the middle, just like the carbon cycle. We've got farmers to the left, which are the agri bit of it, and we've got the culture to the right, which is our accountants and everybody that feeds information into the farmer and helps the farmer. And in the middle where the crossover is, we've got the people that make the most noise, and they drive the culture. So, beef and lamb started... What are they called? Sorry? What are they called? Is that a name? Title? Oh, no. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Depends if they're negative or positive. You've got to be positive, eh? Right? And it's all about positive change. So beef and lamb, for instance, um, rebranded New Zealand lamb and it's taste pure New Zealand. Marvellous. Absolutely fantastic. He won all those medals on a taste test. Now, who's going to guess this number? How many people from beef and lamb have just introduced Taste Pure New Zealand 
rang this guy and said, how have you won five medals for five animals over two years in this taste test for the state of origin? No. No. What's that all about? If somebody tells me the correct answer, or a answer, to that question, you've pretty much solved problems of New Zealand agriculture. Why did nobody ring him and go, mate, that's incredible. Two years in a row, every animal you've put in the state of origin competition was picked for a medal from a blind taste test. Why did nobody ring him? That's the problem with New Zealand agriculture, isn't it? Everybody talks about change, but nobody wants to do it. You brought that up. What were the people, the groups? Who did it? No? Yeah, somebody, the four, the four, four people, yeah. Somebody, everybody, nobody. Yeah, somebody, everybody, and nobody. Yeah. All four of them yeah. forgot to ring him. No, no. Nobody, Ring him. Yeah. Oh, yeah, true. <laughs> Not a bit slow. <laughs> so, you know, and it's all this branding. We're going to brand, we're going to brand, and then guys come up with technology that can do it. I'll tell you another little bit of technology that um, we do that's really whizzy. We, um, we've got a patent on a process of being able to test grass so the farmer knows if he puts animals in that paddock how much urinary nitrogen they're going to produce, right? Because we've got all problems with these animals peeing everywhere, I think, obviously. Anywho, animals can't produce nitrogen. And they can't store it, so sure they've got to pee it out. They've got no storage mechanism. So, this is the problem with the animal? Anywho, we were working with one of the first, the first case of a non-compliant farm in New Zealand. And he rang up and he said, I'm in the poo, deep time. I want to sell and move. My farm is valueless. The real estate agents won't even bring anybody to my dairy farm. Because he was in the red zone around Lake Ellesmere. And his farm was non-compliant because it had a nitrogen leach rate of around 36. And I said, mate, drink more beer, follow the instructions, and you'll be right by the end of the year. So he said, right, eh? I've got nothing to lose. We'll, we'll get into it. So we set him out a fertiliser program. We dropped this artificial nitrogen out of the system, not completely out, because he still had to transition the farm. The end of the year, the uh, overseer model punched out that he was down to a nitrogen leach of 16, compliant. And he went, whew, she's back on the market and I'm out of there. And he bolted. So that was the first case of a non-compliant farm in New Zealand that was valueless as a dairy farm. Sheep and beef guys did actually turn up to have a look at it. But of course he wanted dairy farm money for it because he had built a beautiful cow shed and irrigation and all the drama. So I took it to Environment Canterbury and how many of them rang me? Nobody. Nobody. Zero. Put an article in the Canterbury Farming Magazine. Would you like your farm compliant so that you can meet future nitrogen leach limits so that you don't lose the value of your farm? Because if it's not compliant, you can't sell it. There's a dairy unit. Can they supply, keep supplying? At this well, stage. Can they, can they keep farming? Yeah, you can keep farming because they haven't implemented it. It's coming oh, up. That's one of those mean <coughs> taxation things that are coming up that they don't know how to work out. But if you're clever, you can work around it. So I've got an example of that. Sorry. 
change of funding. It's just that when to start your thought process is changing from the whole biological function on your farm, you've actually got to start some mind shifts, some shifting in your mind what you're doing. So to help us understand that, I'd like the list of all the mammals on your farm. Sheep. Sheep. Yep. Cattle. Cattle. Yes. Horses. Wallabies. Wallabies. <laughs> True that. Neither of those are mammals. Dog. Oh, sorry, they are. Wallabies. Wallabies. Not to sleep, yeah. Wallabies. Do deer. Deer. Goats. Awesome. You all forgot your best mate. Yeah. Hubby. Oh, yeah. humans. Are <laughs> <laughs> you sure the Who does all the work on the farm? Dog. Dog. That's right. So they're all they're all mammals. One of the first jobs you get on as a kid on a farm is feeding animals, isn't it? Even kids know that you feed different mammals differently at a young age. You don't feed a slice of hay to the dog. It'll have good sleep, but it'll go hungry. And you don't chuck a half a leg of lamb or old ram over the fence into the horse paddock. Waste of time, isn't it? But they're all mammals, aren't they? Mm. What are these? Well, they're all plants. Every one of those is a different animal. So in our computer model, we have to know what plant you want to grow, and then we aim to optimise the soil fertility for that plant. Those blueberries, when we started on that orchard there, they were producing at 1.2 to 1.5 kgs a bush on 30 to 35 year old plants. Within a couple of years they were doing 12 to 15. Because we fed the animal right. We targeted the plant with its requirements. Those, that bowl of strawberries, happens to be another one of our clients. They grew the blueberries too. Voted the best strawberries in New Zealand. So were those cattle beasts. Because believe it or not, here's a light bulb moment for you. Humans can taste soil fertility. Because it's more nutrient dense. That's a long story, but we've tested all that. So all these different crops, your grass pasture, that's a bit hard to see, but that's uh, red clover for hay production, lucerne, clover rye grass based pasture, winter crops, they're all a different animal. And they all have slight variations on what their needs and wants are. So I better keep moving. This is the rumen nitrogen utilisation program I was telling you about. That's a whole lot of numbers. Yeah. <laughs> but if you want to get into studying how you are feeding the animal, you have to know the numbers. You've got a thousand lambs doing 100 grams a day and you want a thousand lambs doing 400 grams a day, you have to start being a bit more of a nutritionist. So what we can work out from that is how efficient you're feeding the animal. So these animals here are going to urinate more nitrogen, they're going to have an associated animal health problems associated with high nitrogen intakes and low energy. I'm going to go through this pretty quick because this is an add-on to our main core business. So from those numbers, we, now, we can now work out how to balance up that animal's diet. So everybody goes, kibble crushed maize, oh, I'm not going to feed kibble crushed maize. No way. I said, like, well, you just feed some hay. Hay's energy. Maize is energy. It's all about 
high energy, low protein to balance out the high protein in the pasture. So the computer actually just goes in and goes, what's the perfect world going to look like? And then we decipher the perfect world and go, well, you've got a bit of this and you can buy a few bits of this and chuck in a tub or chuck it on the silage or whatever you've got. So it's just what you tools you have around you. I mean, you don't have maize down here anyway in Southland. Barley, isn't it? Or oats or anything. So it's just that number is just the perfect world. And a lot of our guys, they don't go to the perfect world because they know their economic response to getting their animals up and performing really well is they only have to feed 10, 15, 20% of that. And it's enough to get that animal, get that needle swing, get that needle spun back up as long as you're in the green. I mean, don't ever try and farm in the perfect world because you just go insane. As long as you're about right, you'll get the economic response that you need. So, getting the efficiencies through the soil, pasture and animal, we, we ran this program on a dairy farm back in 2014. And two, they didn't do anything for that herd. They did, they adjusted this herd and over a 60 day period they decreased the urinary nitrogen by 1.3 tonnes and that <coughs> up by 383 tonnes. How do we know that? Fonterra tests for it. So Fonterra tests for milk urea which is directly related to urinary nitrogen so we could use our model and use Fonterra's numbers to equate how our model was working. That's why we got a patent on it, because it worked. So, when we're talking about, and the catchment lady's gone, <laughs> but when we're talking, these are actual feeds that we've received through the lab. Uh, these are both in the same year. So, I've just done a few rough calculations here. So, for every thousand cows, there's a surplus of nitrogen on this farm and they're urinating 4.5 tonnes of surplus nitrogen over and above what they should be because there is an optimum. This thousand cows, are here, uh, thousand cows are only producing 791 kilos over and above the optimum. So do we have a problem with urinary nitrogen in New Zealand? No, we have a problem with knowledge and understanding. The cows don't have a problem because they don't produce nitrogen. They can't produce nitrogen and they can't store it, nor can your sheep. So the cows don't have a problem. So what's driving what's driving it going up? Driving too high protein levels in the pasture. Which drives what drives that? Nitrogen. Yep. Too much nitrogen in the nitrogen carbon cycle. So we're not relying on natural nitrogen fixation to come on board as the soil temperatures warm up. We're just chucking it on and going, oh, I'm going to carve two weeks earlier to get more days of milk and chuck more cows on. It's called moron farming. <laughs> yeah. Just think so more <coughs> and you'll make more. This fellow here, he fell into that trap, didn't he? He thought he was going to make his fortune, but he fell into the trap of being a moron farmer. He just did more, didn't make more. This stuff, he just worked harder and did more. Yeah, it's the margin. It's a marginal return on what you do every day. That's what drives profitability. And I don't know what all this tax, who how it's going to settle down and look like in the future, but if we get to a future in New Zealand agriculture where you can't rely on your your accountant balancing your cash losses against the inflatory rate of your farm, what do we have to do? We have to farm with a cash surplus. So the sooner you get that going on, the better. Because that's where we have to move to. 
can't grow your business on capital wealth, can you? If you're going to get taxed, hammered out of you. So what you have to do is you have to take a bit of cash out and pay off debt, thus increasing your wealth. I wonder if they're going to give a tax exemption on principal payments to try and drive down land values. This problem, national, I've talked to the National Party, everybody's packing themselves out there because the value of land is way too high for the amount of dollars we can produce off it sustainably. So that's adding value according to Ray from Q-Labs. 